In this lecture, I will explain some concepts from big data in biology that might be able to be solved by what I'll call computational pipelines. So one of the problems in analyzing large data sets is that there's so many different algorithms and so many different people involved that the sort of amount of, of complexity in the types of analysis and algorithms that's being conducted is simply a very high. So in order to, to deal with that, um, I'll, I'll here propose that pipelines is a useful way of thinking about those computations. And what do I mean by computational pipelines? So if we start out with a computational mod module being a, a program that takes an input, does a computation and returns some piece of output, then we can define a pipeline as a collection of those computational modules where the outputs and inputs of the computational modules are wired together in a specific arrangement. So shown here on the bottom is the, the simplest case of such pipeline where two computational modules are simply wired together in a sequence. A real life example of a computational pipeline in biology is the tuxedo pipeline. So the goal of this pipeline is to to take raw reads in the form of RNA sequences from two different conditions and then calculate what are the genes that are differentially expressed. So the whole computation is broken down into a sequence of steps and each of the steps are performed by a specific program. So there's the Top Hat program, the Cufflinks program, the Cuff Merge program, Cuff diff program and commi r bond program. So why, why bother separating the tasks and having different programs do each of these steps, you might ask. So the, the main reason is that it makes the task modular. So, so it's therefore much easier to change specific configurations of each of the programs. It's much easier to swap out programs if, if you'd rather use some other program for a particular step. And it even allows you to build pipelines from, if you have a standard set of programs, it's quite easy to build new pipelines from those program elements. There are these other things that I'll call flow diagrams here, which are very reminiscent of pipelines as I've defined them. And here I just would like to stress that these are fundamentally different in that there is no direct correspondence here between those uh, the links and the nodes and the computation. So what these flow diagrams are, are meant to represent is something more abstract about the computations and the analysis that's happening. And that's tremendously useful, but it's just important to keep in mind exactly what is meant by the, the links and the nodes in, in such diagrams. So this particular diagram also describes um, a whole class of different RNA sequence-based methods. So you could even say that the Tuxedo pipeline, as I described before, is sort of a subset of of what's described in this flow diagram here. So if you have very strict correspondences between those computational modules and the visual representation or the, the network representation, what that enables you to do is that you can have these graphical user interfaces where you can essentially have a bunch of modules and then um, put modules together using drag and drop or other visual elements and, and that's very convenient to do for sort of the non-specialist analysts and I've seen a lot of people use this NIME, um, NIME software and it's actually quite efficient for what it does and also it's quite interesting having this one-to-one -one correspondence between your computational and visual representation enables you to quite effectively communicate what a specific pipeline that you've put together is doing. And there's a whole bunch of other 
other types um, of, th of these of these visual representations of workflows. Taverna is another example and I'm showing you here a, a relatively simple, although it looks a little bit complicated, workflow that that runs a, a blast search, retrieves the hits in terms of the sequences, does a multiple alignment, and then constructs a phylogenetic tree and does some visualization. So that's a fairly fairly standard bioinformatics analysis that you you want to do and you maybe some of you have done that before. So what's special about this one is that it uses um, mostly web resources. So the, the local client which runs the workflow is basically, um, is basically sending queries out to different web services as you uh, sometimes do in bioinformatics when you just copy paste something into a web browser and then get some result. So essentially this workflow enables you to to stitch together different components where some of those components can be web based. So, so that's interesting I think because this is an example of something that uses cloud computing and um, also people people share whatever workflows they've, they've made on the internet so currently there's 2700 of these workflows available on myexperiment.org and if you make something new you may want to uh, contribute to that bulk of, of available pipelines. I mean the, the graphical workflows are well and good but it's important to realize that they don't actually do anything that you couldn't do on a command line basis with the programs themselves either in some kind of environment like R or directly on a Unix command line. So here I'm, I'm showing you a an example of a program invocation where we're calling the program top hat from the Tuxedo pipeline before and then we're passing it some, some arguments here P, P8 means uh, we're asking it to start up eight threads so it's a multi-threaded application we're saying that uh, the input files are genes, genes.gtf and the output files is in some particular format and uh, we would like it to have these output file names. So in the Unix system there's a, a, a special pipe operator which is the vertical line and what that is doing is that it, it, it takes the, the output of the program on the left and then feeds it into the input stream of the program on the right. So, so here program 1 reads input.txt then it generate some output which gets sent to the input of program 2 and the output of program 2 gets sent to the input of program 3 and the program 3 writes its output to output.txt. So this exactly qualifies as a pipeline as we have discussed previously. But the special thing about the Unix pipes is that there is an example of um, stream-based computing so what the operating system will do is that when you issue this command it will start all the programs at the same time and so you essentially um, you have a, a parallel pro process running which can be very useful um, if, if that is enabled by the programs that you are invoking. So um, another way to organize these pipelines so you could imagine having, having a script with these pipe commands or even just having a sequential um, script with all of the different steps uh, of the pipeline. But sometimes you, you may get into situations where things just get a little bit too complicated. You have maybe you have multiple branches and maybe you want to keep track of dependencies. So at some point these scripts is sort of doesn't do enough for you. And so one example of, um, of a solution to this problem is to use make files and the program make which can keep track of dependencies and it, it's often used for compiling programs um, keeping track of uh, of compilation dependencies but here you can sort of it, it's fairly flexible and you can use it also for data dependencies so here in this example um, it's very sort of artificially constructed so it's basically doing a again a, a blast search on some database and 
then there's an intermediate result from the blast switch and then there's a filter program called filter blast which takes the blast result as its input and then does some filtering on it. So here the, the dependency graph is, um, is sort of telling it statically the relationship between the different files and also includes the relationships or the dependencies of the programs as well. So if I if I sort of update the filter blast program, like it it'll know that um, when I, I run this um, the make file, it'll know that whatever needs to change or could potentially change because I changed the program, then it'll sort of run backwards through the dependency graph and then rerun all of those commands. So that's um, quite useful. So there's a bunch of other uh, very useful tools as well and here I'm just going to mention one which is Cosmos which is a Python library for keeping track of these kinds of dependencies. So um, to get more technical there's a um, there's an acyclic direct graph which keeps track of, uh, keeps track of the dependencies and there's a bunch of other things that Cosmos will do for you. Like it'll keep track of what kinds of files, the, your different tools that you're defining um, has as input and output. And then you, you basically wrap. So here you see the, uh, the commands in the return in the A section here. It's, um, it's basically just a program invocation as before, but you'll, you'll wrap it in this Python class and it'll keep track of input-output relationships for you. That's so. That's one thing that it'll do. And then also, it, it has these um, uh, functions which some of you may recognize. So it has add, map, and reduce functions, which is uh, very very similar to this uh, map reduce paradigm in parallel computation. So so what this hints at is uh, so, and this I think is a primary reason for for bringing out this cosmos as an example is that it can do um, dynamic constructions of these directed acyclic graphs specifically for parallel computation. So if you have some task that's easily um, parallelizable, then you can specify at runtime what are the rules for separating um, a specific job into sub-jobs and how are the dependencies and the Cosmos package will then keep track um, of that for you.